right, we're all good. Thank you so much for coming. And let's give a round of applause for Sean. Thank you. Just so I can write down, if you guys have any questions and I don't have an answer, I want to be able to get back to you. So um, that, that could happen too. And um, I want this to be kind of informal. If you have a question, feel free to just uh, interrupt me and, and shout it out or raise your hand or however you feel comfortable doing that and, and I'll see if I'm moving too fast or if I go past something and you want to see how that worked, um, I'm willing to, to go back and do it. So, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Sean Hornsby. Um, this is an intro to web game development class, class, meetup, talk, presentation. Let's go there. Um, who am I? Well, I, I've been talking to you guys and so a lot of you probably already know this. I have only been doing this just under a year professionally. Um, I went to a boot camp in Orange County and got a job right after that working on a, developing a, a web app using the MERN stack. So it's uh, Mongo, Express, React, and Node. Um, and that's been fun. It was a contract gig that, that sort of was a startup that didn't get funding and we're still kind of trickling through there. So I'm doing part-time work there. Um, I am a hobbyist game developer. Uh, that's, that's who I am. It's interesting in this context. I also have, uh, you know, I have four kids between the ages of three and seven. So um, I, you just, that's just to let you know, like, you guys can do this. I have a part-time job. I have four kids, and I'm still learning this stuff and, and doing it. And, uh, and I still have the brain power to do it, which is actually pretty amazing. I don't know if, uh, if any of you have kids, one or two or four, you know what I mean. It's pretty, pretty nuts. So um, we'll do a little overview of what to expect here. Uh, the stuff we talked about, this is the program interview. We're going to talk about why you would want to design games, why you would want to spend time building games, um, maybe time that you think, if I'm a real developer, this, is, this could be more productive learning Redux or learning Angular 4 or something else. Um, so we'll cover that. I chose inside the game development, there's a, there's a framework called Phaser. Why did I choose Phaser? We'll talk about that. And then how it all works and some of the uh, accessories to that. And at the end, uh, however much time we have left, we'll do some Q&A. Why should you spend time writing games or thinking about games? Well, I, I think I laid it out here pretty well. Most of it is about fun. It, it's fun to do these things. It's fun to think about it. I'm sure that we've all played games. Probably we all play games occasionally or more than occasionally. Uh, we think about games when we're playing them. Man, I could have done, if this thing was different, or I could design this game, you know, or I could have done something like that. Um, that's, that's a great piece of engagement. You're engaged in writing your code. Uh, if any of you have written like professional code, working on business logic stuff, it can get pretty taxing mentally. It's not a lot of fun normally to think about like, oh, did I do this? You know, do these products filter into the right thing and get get treated? And it's it's taxing, but it's not always very exciting. So um, having some fun is a great way to keep from burning out too. Like to, it gives you even if you're just doing it occasionally, it gives you some time to de-stress and to think about writing code in a way that doesn't have to do with whatever your boss is telling you to do and, and, and uh, maybe six other people filtering down their demands too. Um, and that, the point I think on here that, that is, is very important is that you're going to finish projects because they're fun to do and, and finishing projects is good for you emotionally and mentally to have this finished thing. It's also good for you professionally because it's something you can show other people um, and, you, and you, will, you will solve problems while you're writing games, that other people will need to solve too. And they, you may end up blogging about it or speaking about it, and people will start coming to you for answers in that way. And that's, that's a very rewarding thing also. So when you're writing games in JavaScript, there are probably three main ways you can go. You can work from the ground up. You can dig up the WebGL specs or the, or the Canvas specs, and you can write right there on the metal, you can build your games. Um, it's, it's doable, it's maybe not as fun as it could be because there's a lot of grunt work there. The other end of the spectrum is these fully built, realized tool sets, something like Unity, uh, even uh, Game Creator, uh, Cocos 2D. These are tool sets where you load them up, they fire up, they look like Photoshop or some kind of program and you build your code, you build your pieces in there, you move your stuff around, you do get to write some code, but mostly there's a lot of overhead in learning the tool set and those are, they're actually very powerful. Unity is an incredibly powerful tool set. People build professional level games with those tool sets. Um, and 
that's a great thing, if, but there is some ramp up. And if you just want to start writing, and for me, I like writing JavaScript, so I want to write JavaScript. I look for more of the framework in. Phaser is a framework, so you end up, it's, it's easy to use. You require it in, or you actually stick it in as a script in your index uh, um, file, and then you can just start writing code. You, you have a, J, a JavaScript file that you just start building in. There's a ton of community support. There's actually maybe too much community support. At some point, they decided they were going to hand it over to the community, and so now there's the community edition, and that's, that's what I use. Uh, it's the latest. The documentation is a little messy, but there's so much extra support around there that, that it doesn't matter that much. You can find your way and then drill through the documentation. Kind of, You learn what to look for, and then you go look for it in the docs. Um, there is, on their, on their site, they have this, the, all these tutorials about specific features of Phaser that are great, and there's even uh, a couple of other sites that, that drill in even further. Um, and that's the, uh, so the, that, the Phaser CE, the GitHub is the library or the framework, and then the docs are there too. And these slides will be available later too, so if you see something and you didn't get a chance to write it down or you don't feel like writing right now, there's not a problem with that. Um, and I'm on Slack, so any questions, I'll answer there too. Um, so now you've thought about why, oh yeah, sorry. I think some of it is personal preference. Some of it is what you're trying to get out of it. Are you trying to write uh, Unity? If you were looking for a 3D, like a wonderful 3D game, even if it was like 3D isometric or something, uh, Unity would probably be a better place to look than Phaser. Phaser, and where I've mainly focused is on two-dimensional games. Uh, so you, so if you're look, it's really based on what you need out of it. If you're looking to build something that you want to take to market, and then maybe Unity is a good place to start. Although Phaser games are uh, are are selling, they're on native devices, they're on the web. So uh, it, it comes down to your preference, really. You're going to end up with a lot of the same results, depending on how much work you put into it. Um, I think some of those tool sets like Unity do a lot of the heavy lifting, but there is a learning curve to learning the tool. So um, I just chose Phaser because it's quick. It's easy to use. I don't have to worry about like even learning how to use Unity or teaching you how to use Unity. You can literally get phaser games going in like 10 minutes. Probably even less if you, if you have any experience with uh, front end development at all. So, so that's, uh, any other questions about that? So we got, why would you build games and what would you use to build them? Now what are you gonna build? So if you're, right now you're sitting there thinking, I got a game idea, it's gonna be great. It probably looks something like this. It's this huge, Maybe it doesn't even feel that complicated, but I guarantee you it is a complicated piece of machinery that you're thinking about building. So I need you to scale it down. I want you to think smaller. Now you're thinking smaller. That's a lot smaller. It's a lot smaller. That's still too complicated. For your first game especially, but for, and, and just learning how to do this stuff, there are too many moving parts. And I'm not actually sure why that X-Wing has two pilots and two astromech units. Um, so that's a little weird too. But this is still too complicated. Uh, you need to think simple. That, I think, is obviously a Millennium Falcon, but it is also obviously very simple. There's probably 12 pieces there. That's great. That's where you want to start on your first game, your first project. You're learning Phaser. You're going to learn how to build a game. If you get in over your head, it's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth. You're going to, you're going to get halfway through something, and you're going to get bogged down, and you're going to throw it all away and say, I don't ever want to do this again. This is, this is dumb. Um, I'm dumb, forget it, I'm going to go back to whatever, something else, writing business logic. Even that might be more fun. So then the nice thing too, I mean, I think depending on how old you are, the games that you played as a kid are probably way different than the games I played as a kid. Um, who had like an Atari 2600 or, uh, yeah, nobody. So, so, you, so, so there is this... What I like about it is there's this big library of games that are already built. And when you talk about like Atari games, they're already simple. Maybe your first game was Halo 2. Um, that's, that's in the capital ship category. You're not going to build even a clone or some version of Halo 2. I grew up playing things like, um, like Pitfall and, and uh, Donkey Kong. And so those games are, are reachable. That's something you can do. And I think if you look in that era of games, you're going to find a lot, of, a lot of those already built that already have, kind of they have the UI UX already designed. Players know how to, how to do those things. Somebody thought about how to make that game accessible to people, 
how, what affordances there are, what, it, what makes sense. You don't have to worry about the game design. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You can just focus on writing the game that's already been designed. And that's a, I think that's a great place to start. I started with Pong. I feel like that it's a very simple game. It's still a, literally some moving parts in there. This is some stuff to do, but it's, it's simple enough to, to get through. And so let me break out of this now, and I'll actually, I'll actually fire up Pong here. There we go. I should figure out what port I put that server on to. So that's it. This is Pong. And I'm on the left. And the computer is slowly trying to catch up on the right. Um, I think there's a lot running, so it kind of bogs down a little bit. This is Pong, and I think if you've ever seen Pong, it's a pretty good representation of it. There are still choices you can make when you're designing this game. Uh, so I can, there we go, we'll pause it, we'll get back to the presentation a little bit. But that's Pong. Pong works. Um, and, and I'll show you how that was built. Um, First, though, I'm going to cover a little bit of just the basics. This is a basic phaser game right here. This is all the code. Yes, sir? Uh, yeah. I use uh, VS Code. I've used Atom as well. Uh, I like them both. I like VS Code, although this is probably an outdated opinion. VS Code has a built-in node debugger that I don't think Atom does. And at the time when I was using Atom, it didn't, I like VS Code has a built-in terminal also, so I don't have to switch back and forth a lot. I can just pop the terminal open. Um, Sublime is another popular choice. It's, it's not free, but it is free. I think they suggest you pay 80 bucks for it, but you can use it forever without doing that. Um, uh, who is the WebStorm is a great IDE, but it is, it is, it's an IDE. Something like VS Code or Atom are, are code editors. They're lightweight, they're, they're very low feature, simple to use. If, you, if you're coming from something like, like Visual Studio itself, you might be more comfortable in like a web storm. It has a lot of features. But yeah, I'd, I'd stick with VS Code or, or Atom. So once you get your index set up, and I'll, I'll show you that too, this is, this is all that's required to start a phaser game. Um, you have const game equals new phaser game. And then you have a width and a height for the window that you're going to build. Phaser auto just lets it select between if WebGL, if if WebGL support is there, it'll use WebGL. If not, it'll drop down to Canvas. And then I use Phaser as my div name. That's where it inserts it into the, into the web page. If you don't um, add anything there or on the web page, it just pushes it into the body of the page, which is OK at this level because you're, there's not like a lot of other code going on. My web page is literally just the head and then a script tag. Um, and then I just register a couple, three functions, preload, create, and update. And those are the three. I think you could probably get away with create an update, but preload is, is important in its own right. And then what happens when the game loads is it runs through the preload function once, it runs through the create function once, and then it starts hitting update every frame. So about 60 times a second, it runs through the entire uh, update function. And so let me show you the, uh, let me crack out of this, and I'll show you the index file too, because I don't think I included that in there. This is what, the HTML file looks like. You guys all read that? I hope, because I don't know how to make it any bigger. Um, it's, this is the only two important parts. Well, that's not true. This is important. This is where you require, this is how you get phaser. I use a content delivery network. Um, I, I like that method. And then there's the div that it's gonna stick it in, my phaser div, and then I just have to tell it where my code is. <clears throat> so that's how that works. Now that once you get past that, like this guy right here, this, this blank looking thing, you have a couple things you have to think about. How many of you like global variables? Variables in the global scope? Nobody. That's the right answer. But now we're now we're game developers, so we need these semi-global variables. They're, they're they're actually pretty global. They're going to be out there. They're going to hold a lot of our fun, uh, of our stuff, 
so that those separate functions can access them without having to pass back and forth all these all these objects. So we're going to talk. Well, I'll show you some globals. We'll talk about that, the preload and the create functions. So this is um, this is Pong. This is the top half of Pong. You can see the, uh, the that const game in the top we just talked about. All those let statements are my global variables. Um, if, if this was a year ago, this would be var statements, but this is ES6. I, I like to use, I, I like to stay away from var whenever possible. I don't know if that distinction means anything to anybody at this point, but um, so that's, that's, if you're used to seeing var, anywhere you see var or, or let or const, it's essentially the same thing um, for, the, for the sake of this conversation. So I'm going to do things with these, so I just, I just declare them out there, and then um, you'll see I start using them in create. But in preload, what preload does is while the game is going, and if you're going to reuse assets, it loads those assets and holds onto them. So I have and these game, these audio files, it's loading in, and it's giving them a name. This p hit one is the name. I can refer to that later. And it's going out to there, and it's, it's pulling this association in there. Um, and once you've done that, and in some games you might not have, if you don't have sprites, if you're just using like building graphics and moving things, in fact, you can get away with Pong without preload if you don't. I didn't hear any sound. The sound might just might not be coming through. Um, but if you don't have files to load, then it doesn't matter. The next part is that create section. And that's just, that's just the top portion of create. But what I'm building there is the player. And so I've, I've already got it out there. But I'm assigning it some phaser stuff here. So game is given to me up here. It's the phaser game. And game has a bunch of methods and calls. And at the simple level, when you're, when you're doing things, you're going to add something. In my case, I'm not using sprites, which I'll show you sprites a little bit later, but there's not like complex graphics. I'm just going to build a paddle. You saw the paddle. It's a white rectangle. So here's what I do. I, I tell it where I'm going to put it. Um, and these are, so this is just the width and the height, or the x and the y coordinates of the origin of that whatever I'm going to build next. And I moved it 40 pixels in, um, and then halfway up the screen minus, I know I'm going to make it 60 pixels, so I just cut it in half. So it's starting right in the center of the screen on the left. And then I'm going to do a little fill. And that's a hex um, uh, color code that's just white. And then the next, the one there is the opacity level. It's fully opaque. I'm not doing any, any alpha type stuff. I'm going to draw a rectangle that starts at the origin I gave it. And it's going to be 10, wide and, 10 pixels wide and 60 pixels long or tall. And then the other fun thing when you start working with phasers, you have some Physics models, they actually give you three physics models. Um, this is like, like your question about which, which um, framework or tool set to use. This is kind of the same. Which physics model to use? It depends on what you're trying to do. I'm doing something very arcade -y, so I'm going to use their very simple, lightweight arcade physics engine. This is what they recommend to use if you're going to throw it onto like a mobile app or something, because it's not doing any heavy lifting, uh, super complex stuff. But it gives you a lot of fun things you can do. Once I've enabled the physics, that player has a body, and it has things like this collide world bounds, and it has you can you can start giving it velocity and acceleration and all that kind of stuff. So that's a good question. You can kind of test these. Well, it's going to be in the browser, but the problem is if you're developing this locally and you're just using it as a file system. So if you go in here. Uh, if I go in here and I say, well, I don't need, why would I need a server to run this? I'll show you why. When we, um, if we just open, I have to get in there all the way. Let me. If I open index.html, which doesn't apparently exist, did I go one too far? I did. It's trying to load a file. It's trying to load three files. But I'm in the file system instead of HTTP. And so I get um, a lot of problems. These aren't the problems I expected to get. I expected to get a cross-origin problem because when the browser tries to play in the file system, it gets very specific about what it can do. It can't go get other files. It's, it's the browser is getting in the way here. So that's why I run a, a, a lightweight note like Express server to host it so I can go to localhost and I don't run into the cross-origin stuff. Um, once you have that going somewhere, though, if, you, if I wasn't testing on the file system, you wouldn't need a server at all. You could stick it on, on um, you were saying you were using Nginx. 
and you, you could stick it up there like a static asset, and it would run just fine. Yeah. Uh, it should. So I haven't actually done any like native or mobile testing at all, but something like Pong should definitely work. The, I don't know how complex you can get, and like optimizing your code to make it run better on a mobile device is certainly its own its own like field of stuff. Um, I would say that that's somewhere you could just start jump in and test it. Um, if you have a, a workflow that includes you know deploying it to mobile somehow, then I would go for it and and, and see what you can do for sure. That's a great question though. Um, and my answer is I don't know. <laughs> I test. I I just just work on the web right now. And um, so yeah, let's close it out of that. <clears throat> so yeah, this is uh, this is the preload flow. So this is the whole flow of, of loading an asset and using the asset. Just to show you how it works, that's the preload function we saw. It's loading in these three audio files and aliasing aliasing them to these. Um, names, and then in my create section, I create some. Um, I have these paddle hit one and paddle hit two, and that's where I tag them in there. I say when when we have paddle hit one, it's going to be that audio, and it's preloaded, so it doesn't have to load it at that point. It just is making an association. And then for pong, what I have here is this is when it hit when the ball hits the top or the bottom of the screen, it makes a certain noise, and I have it. I have wall hit. And then it has, because it's an audio, a phaser audio, it has that play method and it should play the sound. And I think if this is all hooked up right, you might actually hear the sound. Maybe I had my sound turned off. We can, I'll try it again. Um, but that's the flow, like that's preload, create, and update. One piece of code going through that whole, the whole thing. <clears throat> so those are actually, I think update is probably the most important part of the, of the program because it's where everything happens. It's where all your logic is gonna live. It's where everything is gonna is gonna do anything interesting. Everything else is just set up. Your preload is just building the assets, and then your create is just saying, okay, put the player here, or put this thing here, get the ball moving here. But once the game starts running, if if you didn't have anything in update, it would just run itself to exhaustion, and nothing would happen. So update is where all the fun begins. And here is a, a slice of update for Pong itself. Um, those top two. Are things that are given to me by the by the physics uh, model called overlap, and so when the the first two things you pass into that are two separate objects or groups of objects, in my case they're just objects. I have a ball object and a player object, and then the third thing is a callback or a function that will run when that happens. And um, I'll talk about overlap a little bit more a little bit later, but the, you can see this, so this when update is called every sixtieth of a second. This runs, just runs through. And it says, okay, well, is the ball body, is the ball at the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen? Then do this. Ball body dot velocity dot y times equals minus one just reflects the y velocity. It just changes direction. So it's going up, now it's going down. The ball also has an x velocity, which isn't touched by that, so you'll just get a pure reflection across that. Um, and then phaser also gives you these cursor keys that you can simply use, it gives you four, the, the four common cursor keys. Um, and here I'm just checking if the cursor, if the up cursor, I know it's very confusing, cursor's up is down. If the up cursor is being held down or is being pressed down while this update is running, then you're gonna move the player body up. I give them, give them a velocity of negative 250, so it's in the Y axis, negative is up and positive is down. And the X axis, negative is, negative is to the left and positive is to the right. So. Yes, yes. And Yeah, th this is, so update is a loop. And I think that sometimes that throws people a little bit, maybe especially people coming from outside of front end development. There, I don't know, is there, if you're, if you're writing a game in like Java, or, or C++, I think you do this thing where you create a fake loop and you say, wow, one. So it just runs, it's this infinite loop that runs. Um, we don't have to do that in JavaScript because it's event-based already. There's already a loop going and we're just tacking into that. This does feel kind of like a flipped version of, of front-end loop development. Like instead of adding an event listener and then, and then calling it there that registers something on the event loop, we're just, we're writing the loop itself. 
So we're checking everything in here. Um, and this is, I mean, they're simple enough that I left them there, but you could even abstract this out a little bit. There are places where I'll, I'll show you some other abstraction. I could just say if this is happening, call a method somewhere else, and it would do the same type of thing. Um, but I just stuck it right in there. So yeah, this update is a loop. This is your event loop, and what you're doing is checking for everything that could happen in that event loop. If I put if I put like this piece of code somewhere else outside of update, yeah, it wouldn't um, unless you called it from update somehow. It wouldn't. Uh, it, so you could abstract the whole the whole class of this. You could abstract out and say, run this thing where you check all the cursor keys. Yeah, yeah. You need to at some point you need to initiate that in update. That's kind of like it's kind of like add event listener is right here. Instead of instead of on the thing that you're doing, you're adding an event listener here. You're saying you're going to get events, so look for them. Yeah. So that's the that's the update loop. And it can get, obviously, it can get pretty complicated. The update is where almost all of your code is going to live. Depending on how crazy your game is or what you're doing, you know, you're going to want to somehow modularize that or abstract it out a little bit so it's easier to read the update loop. You might have your code um, somewhere else. So um, that's what I did with, with overlap, actually. My function reflect lives outside of the update loop. It's written under the update loop. It's still part of the game. It's still part of the phaser object. Um, but it's its own function. So I have like, I have preload, create, update, and then somewhere else I have reflect. And so that's, where, that's what that's calling here, is it's saying, oh, there's a function called reflect, let me go get that. And reflect, when you call overlap, it actually passes in as the first two parameters, the first two things that you gave it. So a ball and a player, or a ball and a computer player. And I chose to call the player author and actor because it can be either way. This, it's doing the same thing. In this case, it's doing the same thing no matter who it hits. So I didn't need to write one for the player and one for the computer player. Although at the very bottom, I started to check because I thought you might, maybe I'd play a different sound when the computer player hits it or maybe I would do something differently, um, keep track of something. But this is what happens is, the, and this is all just code. So the paddle is 60 pixels wide. I, was sent, I, wanted, to, I wanted to make it a kind of dynamic paddle. So if you hit it, um, you know, on one of the top or the bottom, closer to the edges, it gives it more velocity, more up and down velocity. So you can kind of affect how fast the ball is moving and try and uh, get, the, get it moving fast enough that the computer player can't keep up with it. But this is an example of pulling that code out. Because um, you could, in theory, if you've written any JavaScript, instead of writing reflect in there, I could have just written a function right there in the, in the overlap parameter set. I could have just stuck a function in there and it would have looked really horrible and hard to read, but this would have all been in there. This way I can actually abstract it out and then reuse it uh, in, in either case. But that's a, I mean, that's a simple, a simple version of that. But, so, um, I think before we get to this, maybe, are there any questions about the update loop or about how any of that works so far. I'm going to show more examples and, and talk about some more code, but yeah. It's, it's, it, it's really dependent on the, the game itself, but it should be close to 60 frames a second. And there are ways to frame lock and, and to do some other things, like to check to see how that's progressing. If it gets, I mean, I, I think running this and running all this stuff, I think it was having a little trouble just keeping up the game, the browser itself, my computer, um, but you, you can generally count on it being 60 frames a second. <clears throat> so yeah, these are some of the, the utilities. Mine at the top there is the phaser template that I use to start a phaser game. It comes with um, probably more stuff than you need to just get started, but some stuff that I found helpful. Um, some gulp stuff and some browserify stuff for, and some testing stuff. But um, mainly what it comes with is that index file that's already set up to go and that blank phaser template, and you can just start writing code. Um, that way I didn't have to keep doing it over and over again. You can just git clone this as whatever you want and, um, and start going. These are a couple of tools I use. Pixlr is an online image editor. It's great. It's really simple. If you, don't, if you already have something like Photoshop or GIMP or something installed, you can use those. Um, I don't have those installed, so whenever I need to like, manipulate an image, I just fire up pixlr.com, and um, it'll pull images from a URL or from a computer, 
and, and it's pretty robust, although there are some things it's lacking. Uh, Piscal is an app that you can either, I think you can run on the website, but you can also install, and it's a sprite creation tool. So when you start doing animation, you might want sprite animation. It's a great free tool. And BFXR is a weird name sound effects uh, tool that's very simple to use. And if you don't want to like have to worry about finding sound files or whatever, it's, it's cool. You just kind of go in there and say, oh, it has like explosion, and it gives you a, a different kind of explosion. Um, and you can very easily save those files off and, and include them in your game, just to give it a little bit more depth as you're, unless you don't care. If you don't care, you don't need any of these. You definitely don't need any of this up here to write phaser, to program phaser games. But uh, I think they're nice. So um, this is a spot where we can talk about the tools that I use, the tool chain, if that's exciting to anybody. We can, I can show you some more code first. Or we can just talk about this. Are any of you, are you guys familiar with any of these? Or are any of these like weird, familiar with it? Yeah, Express. All right. So Express is um, a server framework for Node. It just makes it a little bit easier to, to get something flying um, quickly. And, and I think I showed, well, I'll, I will show you now. My, um, my Express server for the game is very, very simple. It's 11 lines. It's actually seven lines of real code. Um, and all, like I said, all that does is get me off of the file system and get me to the local host so I can be on HTTP and not have to run into cross-origin stuff. Um, and if you've ever worked with Node or with Express, this might be familiar, and if not, it's pretty quick to explain. Um, Express library, you have to install with NPM. This is my, you know, my package. It's my only dependency at this point because this is a different... The other ones have more dependencies, but... Um, so you require Express. You require HTTP. Um, I'm actually sure. Yeah, that's why, because I use it to create a server. You can do this a little simpler, but this is a still pretty simple. Make const app equals express. That's the thing. This express.static public is the only uh, extraneous library code left in Express these days. Express used to be very bulky. It used to have all this stuff built in. Now, if you want more things, you have to you have to go out and get them. But public or static is left. And all that does is, instead of having to write um, endpoints or handlers for like, when somebody comes to my website, serve them this file, serve them the index file, static says, look, I have a folder somewhere, in this case called public, and in public you will find an index.html, and anything else in public, if index.html asks for it, just give it to them. So in the index.html you'll see I have this JS bundle, which is inside my public folder. So when it hits the Express server and it finds that path, it just, you don't have to write specific stuff for it. You don't even have to understand how this Express server works to use it. Um, this is the only piece you'll probably want to know is what port it's on. In this case, it's 8002 because I'm running, I have several games and I kept like, I'd fire up Node and it would say, oh, that port's in use. And I'd think, oh, which, what did I leave running? So I started separating them so I could do that. But you can put that on any port you want. Um, and then when you go to the browser, you just do localhost colon that port, and that'll be the, the server that's running there. So that's the only piece of express code in there. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, and it could be called anything you want. Public is a is kind of idiomatic. It's the one that people use. And in, in uh, I'll show you, because as I was doing this, I started evolving my process. I actually started bundling um, and a build folder instead of public. So, no, I, well, it depends. If you wanted them on the same web page itself, then you might, you would have them in there somewhere. I, for each project, I have its own folder, its own like top level folder. Yeah, they all have their own, yeah. So like I'm in, I'm in this Pong folder. Uh, and, you know, and Asteroids is in an Asteroids folder, so they're each their own. You, if you wanted to work on multiple games in just one server, one index file, you could you could certainly do it. Um, I just separated them out to keep it easier to think about, I guess. So yeah, that that was the uh, Express. We also had so Gulp is a is a build tool. Yes, sir. So with Express, you No, so for if you're running as a server, you would you would use either you have Node, or we were talking about it too. There's a there's a the 
thing called node mon, which, which is a kind of resilient node server. So you just type node and then the, the server name or the, the file, that express file's name. I call them server.js by convention, but so it would be node space server.js and that'll run that as its own little thing or node mon or whatever. Node, you'll need node on your computer. Um, if you, you have to install it, depending on what system you have. I used Brew, I think, to install it. In fact, I use something called NVM, which is a node version manager. Absolutely not necessary, but pretty handy, because if you start moving through versions, um, I think node's on version seven right now, but some stuff still wants to live on version six. Uh, so if you want to take advantage of like some cutting edge stuff, you might want to work some things in node seven, you might go all the way back to like node 0 0.10 for whatever reason to work on something. Um, NVM is a great tool, but yeah, you'll you'll need to install Node. Yeah, it should run at the command line. If it doesn't, you'll need to get into your um, like your whatever your terminal. Node, yeah, Nodemon's a quick install. NPM um, install Nodemon. I install it globally, so I can use it everywhere. You can install it locally as well. Nodemon is is a great tool. Uh, so, yeah, so that's Node and Express, and that gets you out of the file system so that you can, you can actually like, play with this stuff locally and not have to be like, oh, I'm gonna push this up and host it somewhere and then work on it. Um, and then, so Gulp is a tool, a build tool that is used to, to I use it as a watcher, mostly for my tests. Yes, sir? Yeah, I never learned Grunt. So that's why. And then, then, then another question is why go up instead of Webpack, maybe? Webpack is the new, the new thing. Um, I think Gulp is very simple. I'll, I'll show, in fact, I'll show you my Gulp file. I have it, I'll, I'll show you what I do with it because um, I feel like Asteroids is probably the newest one. So my, I, all I use Gulp for, to be honest with you, is my, running my tests. And so this is a, let me close this up. This is a Gulp file. Um, for, for Mocha tests. And that's the only thing I use it for. You, there is a Gulp plugin for Browserify, and I'll talk about why I use Browserify in just a second too. And that would probably be a smarter thing to do is get Gulp watching all of those and just doing it all at the same time. But I didn't, I didn't like the setup on that plugin, so I just used something called Watcherify, which takes Browserify and turns it into a watcher. Um, but this is Gulp. So with Gulp, you just define tasks, and you usually want a default task and your default task will run any other tasks you want it to run, whatever. And the only ta real task I have is a Mocha task that pipes my code, my specific test code through a, through a Mocha test runner. Um, and if you're not familiar with unit testing or don't care about unit testing, it's not that important. Um, I think that unit testing and test-driven development is an incredibly great way to, to, to develop because I think it, pre it prevents you from screwing stuff up too badly it helps you think about how you're gonna build your code. If you're using it as a test driven, write your tests, and as you're writing your tests, you're actually building your logic. You're building it that way. Instead of like getting really messy and building all your logic and then, and then thinking about how to test it, you're thinking like, what do I want this one thing to do? This one thing, what's the one thing I want it to do? Okay, now I'm gonna write that code that does that. And so this is just a simple way to get into tests. I actually think this is another reason why you should write games because they're simple. They're simple enough that you can write unit tests for them without worrying about like, is this a unit? Is this like, do I have time to do this? If you're writing production code, if you're coming into something, maybe you're an existing code base and you might not have time to think about how to break that down into, into test driven stuff. Nobody may even want you to do it. And so I do think it's important and I'm using games to, to teach me to be a better test driven developer. Um, but that's Gulp in a nutshell and I can show you what that looks like. Um, I'm gonna just run the Mocha one because it will run. But this is it, I have some tests that do some things and the tests pass. That's not exactly what I wanted to do. So that's what happens when you run a Mocha test. It tells you, did it work? And so now what happens is if I go into that code and I change something and I save that file, the tests run again and it breaks, I know right now. Man, the last somewhere in the last 15 characters that I typed in there, I broke my code. It's not like, a week from now, or even an hour from now, when I go fire up the browser and put play the game, and it's like, why isn't, when I turn left, why is it turning right? What did I do? And then I have to go back and figure out what I screwed up. This tells me right away. That's one of the benefits of testing, is it tells you immediately when you broke the code. But that's Gulp. Um,
So browserify in in node, you have this concept up here that you see at the top. This require is a node verb. And it allows you to go get code from somewhere else and stick it in here. Like act like it actually exists. Even though it doesn't exist in this file, it goes and gets it. If you do this on browser facing code, your browser will say, I have no idea what require is. I don't know what you're talking about. And because I don't know what require is, I have no idea what all these other files you're trying to use are. Although I don't think it'll get that far. I think as soon as it hits require, it'll just stop. Um, there are lots of ways to modularize your code. One of them involves just writing a bunch of script files, script tags, and saying, well, I know in the end I'm going to write my app.js, but before that I have a module called math.js and another one called shipphysics.js. So you just start putting those in there. That's okay. That works. But I think it's a lot easier to use Browserify. And I actually ended up writing it as a script. So this is the piece of code right here. I, you install Browserify, either locally or globally again, or both. And then I'm telling it, when the files in this first directory change, output that, bundle it up, and output it into something I'm calling bundle.js. And what that does is anytime it hits one of those requires, it goes and finds that code, and it sticks it in the bundle. So there's no requires in my bundle. There's just all my code. And all that allows me to do is separate out things like you know, I have my app, and I also might have some utility files. And the more, the more code you can pull out of your app, the, I think the easier it is to read your app. Because if your app file gets to be 15,000 lines long, and you need to go dig in there and find something, where do you go? But if you know that it's in this, like, 100-line bundle somewhere, well, this 100-line file somewhere that specifically has to do with turning the ship right, then you can easily step through your code dig through your code, and I think it keeps you more organized. I, I like, I think, I mean, a lot of people I, I've heard, you know, your function shouldn't be more than a screen long. I don't think your files should be much longer than that. If you can avoid it, in some cases you can't, they shouldn't, they shouldn't get so long that you have to scroll forever to find stuff. And so you can, you can, start, you can start pulling your code out, putting it into separate files, and then requiring it back in so that it, you, can, you can use it in a very clean and concise way. Um, and like I said, none of these things are required to do phaser code. These are just code practices. So, I don't think I can help with this question. Yeah. Do you have any problems with running out of money Yeah, I mean, it all depends on how you pull it in and like what you're building as your as your um, um, utility. So in this case, I wrote this as a, this is, you were talking about patterns earlier. This is a revealing module pattern. So I have some stuff inside, and this is, I'm sorry if this is confusing, this is ES6 fat arrow notation. Um, so it might read a little different than you might be used to. If you're using something like, this might more, easily be called like function rotation correction and then have a parent for your parameters and then your bracket. But that's the same, essentially the same thing. But you'll see I have rotation correction and degrees to radians and get heading and radians, but all I export is get heading and radians. So that keeps, that keeps everything else hidden. They're like private members, the Java, the C++ guys in here, those are private methods and get heading into radians is like the only the only piece that I expose. <clears throat> now, I, I haven't looked at the, the code all the way down. I, it's not being exposed. You couldn't call, if you require this module in, you couldn't say, like, let's just say we call the module utility. You couldn't, the only thing you could say is utilities dot get heading and radian, and you would pass it, um, you would pass it a, an angle, basically. If you said utilities dot, Degrees to radians, it would just say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have this. It would say that function does not exist. Yeah. That's a way to keep it clean. I'm not sure, to be honest with you, I'm not sure as far as scope goes or, or what, if, if there's um, any upsides or downsides to that. But we're also game developing, so scope is a little bit hazy at this point anyways. There's a lot of stuff already, you know, going to be in your scope. But the, I guess the nice thing, too, is you can, you can choose... You're kind of namespacing it in a way, but I'm calling it get heading and radian. So it's stuck in that. Now the funny thing about that, 
code there is I actually figured out I didn't need to do that at all. I found another way to do it. Um, but so I don't think it's actually been called in that code anywhere or else I would show it to you. Um, but that's just the other reason to pull those out into files that export things is if you're doing unit tests, you need to be able to require those tests in in your unit test. So, um, so like right here, I have to require it in. I have to pull it in so that I can call it. And if you just bundle all that code into the main app, then it can get kind of tricky to pull out like what exports you want. So one of the reasons I pull code out into smaller pieces is so I can test it in smaller pieces. But once again, if, you're, if testing isn't important to you or something that you're comfortable with, it's not important. It's not, it's not important to game development in, it, in and of itself. This is just kind of a, an aside. These are things that I think are great to learn, and I think game, doing it in a, in a field of game development makes it a little easier and more fun. I think this is what what I take away from writing game code is that you're going to make mistakes. Whenever you write code, you're going to make mistakes. Big mistakes, small mistakes. I wrote, just in the three or four games that I wrote in the last few weeks, I made a ton of mistakes. And then I would come back and refactor them out or find them later. But the good thing is you learn. If you don't learn from the mistake itself, you might learn from having written code you didn't need to write. Like all of that that angle correction stuff, I didn't need, it turns out I didn't need to write it. But I wrote it, and I learned how to do it, and now I understand trigonometry a little better than I did before. Which was fun, because I thought I understood it pretty well, and I spent about 45 minutes thinking I knew what I was doing, and it turns out it's been way too long since I had a trig class. I think personal projects are a much better place to make mistakes than at work, or, or even for other people work, um, or in front of other people. I think it's great if you can if you can learn from your mistakes in the privacy of your own IDE. Um, I think that makes it's just it's just a little easier, and then you're not pissing off your boss or your clients or anybody else. Um, so it's a great outlet for making mistakes. You can you can think like when you've done it. You, I got my quota of mistakes for this week. The more you write, especially small projects, you, there's going to be a lot of repetitive stuff that you're doing over and over again. And so you're going to want to find, this is something I think is important for every programmer, is because I think generally programmers are very like immune to this pain. They will do it over and over again. They will type it out because it's worked and it's always what they've done. I think what you should do instead is find a way to not have to do that. If you've done something twice, figure out a way that the next time you won't have to do it. You should never have to do it a third time. That's why I made the phaser template because I was writing this code and I thought, this is too much. And then sometimes as it evolved, I'd have to go back and think, wait, what did I do? Did I do that right, or how did I do this? Now it's locked in somewhere, and I can just bring that code down and start writing. And I don't have to think about the setup and the spool up and all this stuff that goes into like getting things ready. That's done, so that's great. There are other things that you'll find that you might be doing a lot in your games. You might be writing this, maybe you're writing some similar games, or maybe they're not even that similar, but you're gonna find that there may be code that you write over and over again. Maybe it's subtle variations, but code that you're using over and over again because it's a very base level piece of code. Man, you should write that and you should bundle it up somewhere and you should put it somewhere that you can say, I don't have to write that anymore. I can, if you want, you can copy and paste it or I can just somehow require it in. You can just pull it in. It's now you're building your own library of functions and code and things that you're comfortable with. I think that's great. And that ties in with the last one where you're gonna see, you're gonna know, if you're writing games that only take a couple of days to, to go through, and you're doing that three or four times a week or a month or whatever, you're going to see those things are very frequent and are happening very often. Whereas if you're writing, um, when I was working on React, this was in you know September, the first two weeks of September last year is when I started this React project. And I didn't have to start another React project until last month. And it was like I had never done it before. I had no idea what I was doing. It was like, wow, I was looking at my startup why did I do things this way? And do I need to do them this way? And so that's when you have these long cycles, it's hard to find those, those things and encapsulate them and document them somehow. You just think, well, I'm doing it and I'll do it. And then the next time I'll remember. But you won't. You won't. Um, and so if you're doing that a couple times a week or a few times a month, you're going you're gonna to get sick of it a lot quicker than if you're only doing it twice a year. And you're going to figure out ways to make your code reusable. I think that's a great, that's a great thing. Those are important parts of being a programmer: is reusable code, um, and the more you do that, especially as you start to 
think like, well, this works pretty much the same way, but not exactly. And then I'm using it a third time and it's slightly different. You're going to figure out how to distill that, that essential function down into a smaller piece of code that is extensible in some way. Um, and I, this is where I'm going to say like raw, raw functional programming is, is great. If you can do that and you can start to compose your software, you're going to find it, it's going to be a lot easier to do that stuff. Distill it down into small pieces that you can chain together. And then when you need to chain it together in a different way, you just take this piece out and put this other piece in and it works just how you want it to. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you do it. So um, I think those are, the, those are the big things. This is my inspirational quote. The critical ingredient is getting off your butt and doing something. It's as simple as that. I don't know how many of you know who Nolan Bushnell is. He is the co-founder of Chuck E. Cheese. He also started Atari and wrote Pong the first time. So that's why it's up here. But he did co-found Chuck E. Cheese. Um, I think it's a great quote. That's, that's the truth. Do it. And by doing it, you're going to learn to do it better. Or you're going to learn you don't like to do it, and you'll move on to something else. But if you just think about it, I think we all do this. I know I do this. I think about wanting to do it, wanting to learn something, wanting to build something, but I talk about thinking about it instead of doing it, and then it doesn't get done. Do it. Um, yeah, so that's it. This is me. These are ways you can get in touch with me. Uh, you can like go through my GitHub if you want to see some examples of interesting code or not interesting code. Um, the phaser template's on there, and that's my email address. So yeah, any questions or anything I didn't cover that you hoped I would cover? Or we can look at more code, running examples. I don't know what time we're at. Yeah. Uh, so I want to go ahead and uh, give a round of applause for Jeff.